Good morning. Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath once again. Man, it's good to be in God's house, isn't it? Man. So today, as we start our sermon, I want to share with you an experience. Growing up, did any of you ever, did any of you ever watch on the t- TV show like National Geographic, for their, where they say, you know, today we are going to go on an adventure. And they talk about how they're going to go and they're going to uncover some secret message or some secret artifact from all the way from like back in the time. And you, you watch and you continue to fall with them. And you know, they're going from, from, from point to point where they're like, okay, here we got this place, we got there, we got there. And they're putting in all the puzzle pieces together. And I remember when I was a kid, I loved to watch these because I, you know, be these ones about they're going into the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics and they're going through and they're looking at all this. And as a kid, I'd be like, yes, okay, so we're going there, we're going there. And at the end, I'd be like, yes, high five, we got it. But again, it was a TV show, so they would they would have gotten it without me. But as I was looking at it, I realized the one thing that I loved so much about these TV shows was that they had an element of mystery. You know, and as I begin to think about it, I realize that we all, no matter what age we are, we kind of like this element of mystery. Think about it. Throughout, you know, if you go on TV, you see all these TV shows, you see all these mystery books, but even more, we like mystery in life. Think, when you got like a new job, going to a new place, there's this thrill, there's this mystery to it. And I can also think about when you first meet that, for those of you who are married, when you first met that special someone, there was that kind of mystery. And then as you met them, you know, the mystery went away and you you weren't in love with the mystery anymore, but you were in love with the person. And then for me, I can think of when I would change schools, like when you first go, there's just that mystery to it. There's that newness, that excitement. And just kind of that thrill where you get that adrenaline rust every time you go the mystery. And because of this, growing up, I begin to, to get into something, and, and I have to make a confession to you guys, because I used to get into something called conspiracy theories. H- have you ever heard of these? I mean, you have Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and when I was little, I, I would love to look into these conspiracy theories. And there, there was this one TV show where they'd be going and chasing monsters after monsters after monsters, and it looked like they were going to find them. But in the end, they never found him. And I keep watching, I was like, okay, maybe next time they'll find Bigfoot. And we go, 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 and they had all this great proof, but they still never found Bigfoot. And, I, and as I begin to, to dive in deeper in this, I, I begin to realize that I was spending so much time trying to get, gain this kind of this high on this thrill, this mystery, that I was spending all my time looking at these conspiracies, chasing after a Bigfoot, that I wasn't spending my time in something that I could actually trust. Because I soon began to w- realize that this, the little chance that B- Bigfoot is really out there, which I don't know if he is, why should I spend all my time chasing after a Bigfoot when I can spend my time chasing after the Lord? Amen. So I begin to dig into God's Word. And this morning, I want to share with you, because in God's Word, I found an age-old message. And it's not a secret message. There's nothing secret about it. But it's a message that has been there from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end. And the only thing that is secret about it is that it's been overlooked. So this morning, as the TV shows would say it, let's go together on a journey to uncover this message that God has for us. But before we do that, let's start with a word of prayer. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Dear Father, Lord, my God, Lord, this morning, we just want to praise you for how amazing and for how awesome you are, Lord. Uh, Lord, as we start going, digging into your word, we just pray that you open our eyes and our ears to what you have for us this morning. Lord, hide me behind your cross. And Lord, may the words I speak only bring honor and glory to you. In your name I pray, amen. So as I begin to dig deep into the Bible to uncover this age-old message, 
you could sum this age-old message up into one word. And this word is come. From the very beginning of the Bible, God has been telling his people to come. Turn with me to Genesis 3, verse 8 and 10. Genesis 3, verses 8 and 10. And here we see what happens right after the fall of man in Genesis, 8 verse, or Genesis 3, verses, verses 8. It says, then the, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, and he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord. God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to man, and he said, where are you? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man, then the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave the fruit, some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? So when God went to the garden, what was the first thing that he said? Where are you? You know how funny this is? Because God of the universe, he knows where everybody is. He knows, he knows how many hears are on your head. Why did he have to say, where are you? It was an invitation to come. You see, God could have just came in the garden, picked them up by their legs and said, what have you been doing? I knew you were supposed to eat it from that tree, but no. He says, where are you? Because he wanted his children to come to him. But check this out. If we continue, go with me a few pages to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And we have the story of Noah and Noah's ark. And here we find this same age-old message. Because in Genesis 7, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And what was Noah's message to everyone while they were building the ark? Come. But it doesn't start here. Stop here. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 1. And in Isaiah chapter 1, starting with verse 15 through 18, we see that the same age-old message is repeated once again. And in Isaiah 1 verse 15 it says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my face from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. But verse 18, it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And then we see, if you turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We see the same age-old message repeated once again. And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, Jesus himself repeats the same message. And in Matthew 11, verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And finally, if we go to the end of the book, Revelation 22, verse 17, we see God's final appeal 
to his people. And in Revelation 22, verse 17, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take a free gift of the water of life. So here we see, since the beginning of the fall of man, God has had one message to his people. And that message is for them to come back to him. And as we saw last week, we saw that many of us have not heard the call because we've forgotten where we're supposed to come to. Last week we talked about how many of us forgot that this world is not our home, but that our world that, or that our home is in heaven. And that we shouldn't store our treasures on this world, but that our treasures is in heaven with Jesus. But going back to our key verse, Revelation 22, verse 17, it says, the Spirit says come. Who is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit. And so from here we see from the very beginning of the fall, God has continued to woo his children. Look at it. If we, when we go back, we have the Garden of Eden where God says, come to me. Then we have in the desert where God established the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, he says, come to me. He says, if you sin, have, do a burnt offering. He says, if you're happy, if you want to be me, do a Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving offering. Do a fellowship offering. Whatever you do, just come to me. But yet, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. And so what did the God of the universe do? He sent his one and only begotten son to continue this message to us to come to him. And what blows my mind here is, this is going to be, I'm going to paint a scary situation, but if you were God, what would you have done? I mean, that's scary to think about. I mean, imagine, you, you, you created these humans. You created these humans, and they barely spend five minutes a day with you. They ignore you. They curse you. And some even say that you don't exist. And, and this is scary because if, if I was God, I know what I would do. If I was God, I was like, oh, I don't exist. Oops, sorry. But what does God do? What does our God do? This, this is the greatest mystery of all time. Because the God in heaven, who has everything he could ever want, he could ever desire, wants us. Did you ever think about that? If God, God could create another, God could create another earth, he could create another thing, but yet he wants us. And he wants you so much, he wants you to come to him so much that he put the whole universe on the line and sit in his one and only son to die on the cross just so you could have the opportunity to come to him. This is the love of God. And I don't understand it. But this is the love of God. But yet, for ages now, we have not heeded that call. We have not come to Jesus. Why is this? Why have people not come to Jesus? Well, if you turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. S 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. <clears throat> 
God's word says. And in every sort of evil that deceive those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and that they all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but who have delighted in wickedness. My friends, the only thing that can keep us from Jesus is us. But turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Oh, no, Revelation, sorry. Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And for those of you who were there at prayer meeting, we read this during prayer meeting. But in Ro- Revelation, or in Revelation, Romans chapter 1, sorry, I've been in Revelation too long. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a deprived mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, fatherless, or faithless, heartless, ruthless, Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. So who are they talking about? Are these people that don't know anything about the church, that don't know about God? No, these are people that know the truth, they know the right thing, but yet they love the sin. And from generation to generation, this has been the one thing that has kept God's people from him. There's nothing else. There's truly nothing else. Because God's paid the price. He gave his one and only son to die on a cross for you and me. But it's the love of sin that can keep us away from God. And you see, the devil, he's good at deceiving, isn't he? You know, he's been deceiving before you and I were born. And he's, he's created these two train of thoughts. And two of these train of thoughts, and one of them is that, you know, our sin isn't that bad. I don't know if you ever talked to anybody, but they're like, you know, my sin is it's not that bad. You know, it's just a little, it's, you know, it's, God doesn't care. It's, it's, it's not that bad. And the second one is the devil has created a thought pattern where we actually stop really seeing our sin. We're like, oh, you know, it's not, it's not that bad. Is that really a sin? I don't know. I mean, it's just a Sabbath. You know, it's okay if I do that, right? I mean, it's, it's okay. God, God understands. It's not a sin. And it, and it kind of reminds me of that old saying, and to keep this kosher, that someone thinks their gas doesn't stink. And you probably heard this. They don't think their gas doesn't stink. And this reminds me of a story of one of my friends, and I'm not going to say his name, but one of my friends, we grew up with him, and he believed that his gas didn't stink. <laughs> Mercy. So, for my younger ones, you've probably been through this, but you know, when you're in a group of friends, and, I, and this, this sounds a little crude, but it, it's, I'm making a point. But you're in a group of friends, and someone lets one out. You know, and everybody, they, they do that little blaming game. You know, like, did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Did you do it? No, no, I didn't do it. And when this one happened with my friend, he's like, guys, you know I didn't do it because my don't stink. <laughs> well, let me tell you, his did stink. <laughs> and he, and you know, most of the time, it was him. But you see, the same thing happens in our own lives. Because you see, gas is gas, and it stinks. The same thing is sin is sin, and it stinks. So no matter how big, no matter how little, sin is sin. And praise the Lord, when we get to heaven, 
There's not going to be any sin there. There's not going to be any suffering, no death, nothing. So if there's not going to be any sin, how can we think that our little sin is going to make it? See, it doesn't matter how big your sin is, it doesn't matter how small your sin is, if you're holding on to your sin, to your secret sins, to your habits, the stuff you know God doesn't want you to do, but you say, oh, it's not that big deal. How are you going to expect to, be, to go to heaven? Because if there's not going to be any sin, how are they going to make an exception just for you? Which is why each and every one of us, no matter how big our sin is or how small our sin is, we need to give it to Jesus. Because only he can take our sins away. Only he can wash us as white as snow. But going back to your key text, turn back with me to Revelation 22, verse 17. Because you see this last age old message, there's three parts to it. Because you see, first we see that the Spirit says come. But then next it says the bride says come. Who is this bride? It's the church. As we learned a few months ago, the bride in the Bible represents God's church. The church is Jesus' bride. So what does it mean when it says that the church says come? You ever think about that? My friends, it means that as a church, by our actions and by our words, we need to be telling the whole world to come. Amen. To come to Jesus. And this happens when they walk through the door, as they sit in the pews every moment, they need to know that this is a place where they belong. And where does that start? That starts with us. We need to show them God's love. We need to show them that we are glad they are here. And as I was reading this, this reminded me of a, a moment when my family went on vacation. We went on vacation to an outside state, and we, on Sabbath we went to church. I'm not going to say where it was, but we went to church, and this was a small church. They met in, in the gym, and what I remember is their gym had these really cool like ceiling panels, so I always just loved it when I was little. But we went to this church, and it was a really small church, and like my family's pretty big. I mean, there was like six of us in all. So us coming to this church like double their church. So I mean, there wasn't a, there wasn't a question if we were visitors. And we, we, we go to their church, you know, they, they give us the greetings. And then in the pulpit, the pastor's talking about how friendly their church is. But you know what happened? After church service is over, nothing. No one stayed and talked with us. No one invited us to their house. My friends, my greatest prayer is that that can't be said of our church. Because my friends, I believe that we are God's last day church. That we have a message that can change people's lives and that can change the world. But if we don't invite them to come in, why would they come in? And even more as a church, we need to be encouraging each other because, my friends, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen? And if Jesus is coming soon, we need to be encouraging each other to continue to walk in the way. But you see, going back to our key text, there's one more person who says, come. And it says, and let him who hears say, come. Who could that be? Do you, do you hear me right now? Who, who could that be? That's us. That's each and every one of us. And we are to say come, but who are we to say come to? To whoever is thirsty, let him come. And to whoever wishes, let him come and take a free gift of the water of life. My friends, the last part of this age-old message for us is for each and every one of us to tell the world to come. Have you watched the news lately? Have you seen the pain, the suffering? 
It says that we're supposed to tell those who are thirsting to come. And it doesn't take long watching the news. It doesn't take long going to Walmart to see that this world is thirsty. That, the, that people out there are empty. Why do you think our young people, why do you think people outside the church are going to parties, are into drugs, are having sex? Why do you think they're doing it? Because they're thirsty. And my friends, if you turn with me to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. We have the story of the Samaritan woman. And God's word says in John 14, verse 13, Jesus answered, Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty. Again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. My friends, nothing in this world can ever fill you. If you're thirsty, if you're feeling empty, if you're missing fulfillment in your life, you're not going to find it in this world. No clothes, no car, no job. Nothing's going to nothing's going to fill that thirst but Jesus Christ. Amen. It's cuz Jesus Christ is that he is the water of life. And if you'll turn with me very quickly to John 7 a few pages over, John 7 verses 37 and 39. God's word says in John 7, verses 37 to 39, it says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I have a question for you. Let's say you're driving through a desert, and you're driving through a desert, you're in your car, and you come upon a person who has been stranded out in the desert for four days. And you pull aside, you open up the door, and you know, he tells you his story. My question for you is, would you give him something to drink? Would you give him something to drink? Yes. My friends, why do we every day pass by people who have been thirsty, who have been without water their whole life, and not give them something to drink? My friends, there are people out there who have never heard the good news, who have never heard that Jesus Christ loves them, and that their fulfillment isn't in this world. It isn't in anything this world has to offer, but it's in Jesus. And that their home isn't this old, messed up world, but that their home is in heaven. My friends, each and every one of us, we need to be telling the world, we need to be sharing the water of life. Because if we have the water of life in us, we can't help but share it. And I want to be honest with you, because I don't even know if this pastor has been doing it the right way. This morning, we had a young man who I've never seen in my life come through these doors. I was outside, I greeted him, he came in, he got a bulletin, stayed for a little while, and then about 10 to 15 minutes, he went out to head to the car. As you head to the car, I walked up and I said, oh, you're leaving already? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta go, I gotta go do stuff. And so, you know, I, grabbed, I, I stopped him, I shook his hand. I was like, man, if you can ever come again, you know, this is a church, we want you here. And I even plugged in, I was like, you know, if you're ever hungry, we, we have fellowship lunch. You know, <laughs> that, that, that'll, that'll get him. But you know what he said to me? 
He said, you know, I'm not hungry. I just need God. And he walked away. Did I, did I do right? I don't know. But all I do know is that this world is thirsty and we have the water. My friends, we have the word and that's Jesus Christ. We know the truth, but are we sharing it to the world? How we begin to hoard our water? I pray it not so. My friends, Jesus has given us when his last message, his last appeal in the last book of the Bible is for us to tell the world to come. He has given us the responsibility for us to go out there and for us to tell people that there is a God, that there is a Savior that loves them so much that he died, that he went off his throne, which we can't even imagine, to pay a price that you and I should have paid. My friends, we need to tell the world this. We need to tell the world because the world is thirsting for the truth. But if we don't tell them who is, to close, I'd like for us to read our meditation in the back of your bulletin. It's found in Testimonies of the Church, volume 9, page 24. And it says, The light that God has given his people is not to be shut up within the churches that already know the truth. It is to be shed abroad into the dark places of the earth. Those who walk in the light as Christ is in the light will cooperate with the Savior by revealing to others what he has revealed to them. It is God's purpose that the truth for this time shall be made known to every kindred and nation and tongue and people. In the world today, men and women are observed in the search for worldly gain and worldly pleasures. There are thousands upon thousands who give no time or thought to the salvation of the soul. The time has come when the message of Christ's soon coming is to sound throughout the world. My friends, that time is now. Each and every one of us needs to be telling our neighbors, telling our friends, telling our, the acquaintance, telling that waiter at that restaurant that there is a Jesus, that there is a God in heaven who loves them and who is coming soon. But that takes us getting out of our comfort zone. And that's the hardest thing. For us to be a, church, a loving church, it takes us to get out of our comfort zone. And all I'm going to say is, if Jesus was willing to get out of his comfort zone for us, as Christians, should we not be willing to get out of our comfort zone for him? Because God and Jesus has entrusted us with his last day message for the last, for the end of the times. And he's given us the responsibility to spread this message from, to the ends of the earth so that everyone will know. What exactly is this message? Well, you have to come back next Sabbath to find out. But what you can say is let every single person you meet know that there is a God in heaven, that there is a Savior named Jesus Christ, who loves them so much and who has made a home for them in heaven. Each and one of us can do that today and forever. And my challenge for you this week is a simple one. In my hands, I have two little tracks. Um, some people call them glow tracks, some people call them tracks. And this is what my challenge for you is going to be this week. It's, it's not a hard one, don't worry. But my challenge for you this week, if you're willing, is to hand one, just one, to a friend, a neighbor, a business partner, a waiter, and let them know the truth. Just one. I'm not saying you have to take a whole pack. I'm saying you're just committing to one. 
And you might be like, well, I don't know how to do it. Don't worry. <clears throat> it took me a while to learn how to hand these out. And I'm going to give you a quick, quick little tutorial on how to do it. If, if you're uncomfortable, this is all you have to say. You have your glow track. You walk up to that person that the Holy Spirit has told you to hand it to. And you say, you know, I've read this, and I like it, and I think you're going to like it. And you hand it to them, and you say, here's a gift for you. And be like, if you like it, pass it on. If you don't, throw it away. Say, God bless, smile, and walk away. It's that easy. And all we're asking is if you will be willing to commit to sharing God's truth to one person, to get out of your comfort zone just once this week. And if you're willing to do that, I'd like to invite you to stand up. We're not going to force everybody going, but if you're willing to take just one track and give it to someone to let one person know the truth, we invite you to stand up and our deacons will begin to hand out tracks to you right now. And as the deacons hand it to you, once you grab your glow track, you may sit down. And as you receive your glow track, this is all, this is what, this is all you need to do. When you get it first, pray. Say, God, I know there's someone out there that needs to know the gift of joy. And once you read it, or once you pray over it, read it. So this way, when you go to someone, you know what you're giving them. And after you give it to them, pray again. Because who knows what could happen from one glow track. Who knows, when you get to heaven, that one person you prayed for, the one person you gave this glow track to, could be in heaven because of your one selfless act. Because you were willing to get out of your comfort zone for Jesus. My friends, Jesus is coming soon, amen? Amen. amen. But until he does, it's our job, it's our opportunity to tell the world that he's coming soon. And my friends, when we all get to heaven, when we all get there, when Jesus comes back, it's my prayer that each and every one of us and the one person we gave our glow track to will be able to stand side by side and see Jesus as he comes again. Because this world is thirsty and we have the water. So may this week, may we tell people to come to Jesus. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, my God, Lord, how wonderful you are. Lord, from the very beginning of time, you've been telling us to come. And Lord, it's my greatest desire that each and every one of us here will come to you, Lord. May we put away our sins. May we put away our distractions. And may we be fully yours, Lord. And Lord, may you give us the, the courage and the boldness to tell the world about you, Lord, about how there's a Savior in heaven who died on a cross for us. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.